This is Chapter 16 of the State and Local Government course, Criminal Justice. And let's look at some basic types of crime that states are going to be dealing with. We won't be talking too much about federal crimes in this chapter. So some of these are fairly well-known violent crimes, property crimes, white-collar crime has to do with people that are in positions of business or responsibility that could be perpetrating fraud on, on victims. Drug crimes, talk a little bit about that. We'll also touch a little bit more on victimless crime later on. So when we look at how to measure crime, the FBI has what is called Uniform Crime Reports. And this is a fairly difficult thing to do because the federal government has tasked the states to take care of their own criminal codes and handle their own criminal business. And so therefore, it's difficult to get consistent uniform reports through the FBI. And so there's other options such as what are called victimization surveys. And these surveys suggest that the crime rate is potentially twice as high as what the FBI's uniform crime reports tend to measure. That shows you how difficult it may be to get an accurate, consistent measure of how much crime there actually is out there. But there does seem to be some agreement and strong consensus on the fact that crime has been declining quite, quite uh, significantly since the 80s really started to pick up in the mid-90s when it started to drop. Looking at some, well, this is from the book, figure 16.1. Here they're measuring total crime, violent crime, and pop property crime, which uh, the uh, tend to, particularly property crime and uh, total crime, definitely seem to be correlated here. But as you can see, as we get into the early 90s here, it starts to decline dramatically. So we'll talk a little bit about, there's, it's not just any one thing. There's several things that may be contributing to this general decrease in crime. Now, as far as the quality of the crime data, we already know that the FBI UCR reports are um, somewhat underestimated, but we also know that only about a half or so of crimes are actually reported and that there's some types of crimes that are reported more than others, particularly whether it might be violent crimes reported more than minor property crimes. And we know that uh, sexual assault and rape, those, those types of crimes aren't just only in the last few years have been started to increase in the reporting rates on those because of more awareness of that. And when you're looking at these crime statistics, the white collar crime and the drug crimes are handled differently. They're not even included in this type of crime data. So well, as far as some basic factors of crime, I mentioned one already. We see that when the economy is in a recession, you have more employment, potentially more people on government assistance, less happy. If they're so inclined, may be more tempted to commit crimes to to uh, help themselves out. So the economic factors are a fairly strong correlation. Sociolo sociological factors are also big too, as far as as we've already touched on before. Socioeconomic income strata that could pass down transgenerational values as far as respect for the rule of law or what environment the children may be brought up into. So family instability, drug abuse, those are some sociological factors that continue to contribute to crime. Educational factors, we know that the increase of education does have a direct uh, inverse correlation with, with less crime. And there's also the idea that you might be able to get away with it. You know, we're not talking about everybody here. It's just people that are so inclined to commit crimes may see a lack of deterrence when we 
uh, looking at the stats here, we see that few of the 20 and 20% of all property crimes in the U.S. are cleared. That means either they're closed or solved. 48% of violent crimes, and I saw a recent stat just not too long ago, that 62% uh, of murders are cleared. And, but that's dramatically down just from the last uh, few decades. So uh, we see that it's um, not, not a real solid return rate there of solving crimes. And we also see that two-thirds of all arrests do not result in any form of punishment because of lack of evidence or the charges are dropped. Now, as far as some broad general reasons as to why the crime rate has been declining since the early 90s, well, we see that technology, you know, police efforts, police expenditures, forensics, DNA, those are solving more crimes and actually perhaps even providing a little bit more of a deterrence of people wanting to commit crimes. Now, this is a controversial one here. We do see that the United States is a very punitive society. We have more people in our prisons than any other country, and we have a huge chunk of, as far as the percent of people in the world that are in prisons. The United States has a considerably larger percent of that, proportionally speaking, and that's because of a long tradition of kind of a, from the Christian roots that we've had, as far as justice, punishment, retribution. We also see that gun control measures have had some effect where making it a little bit more difficult for guns to get into people's hands. That's still uh, a big issue now to try to predict whenever a mass shooting comes up. There's questions of how the, the guns were obtained, how that particular person got the guns. But it has been part of this equation since the early 90s when the Brady Bill was passed, which was some of the first in a long time federal regulations on gun control. And then there's been some philosophical differences over the years where community policing, where the police officers become a little bit more a part of community, taking a little bit proactive role and trying to make sure that neighborhoods don't get run down to where it's conducive to crime. So the positive forces are trying to take root. This is called the broken windows approach to where if there's something that's going wrong or needs maintenance or upkeep, they jump on that, get that done quickly to, to maintain a positive environment that is less attractive to the criminal element. So that's one of the other factors there. And uh, surveillance, surveillance, of course, is, uh, is part of this technology equation where in some cities such as New York and London it's hard to go pretty much anywhere outside of the building to and not be on some sort of surveillance camera somewhere or when you look at all the private businesses that have their own security cameras that can put piece a lot of that together. Now there's some other things where police local police forces have taken on different types of tactics uh, New York was recently struck down on their stop and frisk program where they were, if there was reasonable suspicion, they would check people out uh, and it you know, had to have probable cause, obviously. And it's resulted in a lot of confiscation of weapons. So that it did have some positive aspects to it, but it was shot down because of the profiling issue where Officers, it was hard, it was difficult to prove whether or not officers could potentially be profiling minority groups because of um, they may be in, America, in an area where they officers may just assume that they're suspicious. There's other types of things to where police departments would send out uh, notices of getting awards to people that had warrants, and when those people showed up to get their cash award, they would close the auditorium doors and say, okay, everybody's under arrest. You know, so obviously the, uh, some of these may be controversial or, you know, at least innovative in order to try to you know, keep the crime rate down or provide more of a deterrence for this type of uh, activity. 
and our aging population is part of the equation because if there is some truth to the fact that you know I'm too old for this stuff is that as you age it's, you're less and less likely to get involved in criminal activity and then the drugs of course which have been uh, a constant battle for for many decades is that when people get into drug addictions they may be more inclined to commit some sort of crime in order to get their drugs and so therefore the increasing awareness on treating drug addiction as a, a disease and a dependency rather than as a criminal offense and increasing avenues of getting treatment so that is also part of this equation to where crime rate has been declining quite significantly as you saw on that chart since the 90s. Now, what are the intergovernmental roles here? Now, as I've already mentioned, it's even stated in the Constitution that states are responsible for their own trials, of all their own criminal trials. So therefore, the states have to figure out what those crimes are. And so as far as crime fighting in America, it's pretty much a 95% state and local responsibility. Over a million employees involved in, in criminal justice system, 7.7 .7 billion total payroll. So we're looking at a relatively minimal federal involvement. Now, of course, we're not talking about federal crimes, which would be a different uh, topic. And um, you know, federal courts is, is operates parallel with the uh, with the state courts, you know, because we've already seen how that works. And uh, but 90% of the dollars that are spent come from the state and local government. And so they they have to generate that revenue in order to uh, maintain their police forces and their, their criminal their courts and their criminal justice system. Where we're starting to see greater national involvement are these crimes that are fairly difficult to peg down to one state, such as cybercrime. That one's becoming more and more of an issue as, as we get more and more plugged in onto the internet, into our social interaction on the uh, digital media. Lots of hacking and fraud, cyber crimes that are perpetrated over the internet. Uh, another federal government involvement would be with organized crime, particularly if they are crossing state borders and trafficking in some sort of illegal substance from one state to another. And then particularly since 9-11, terrorism has become a major issue and the De Department of Homeland Security was created in order to try to protect the uh, interior of the United States from terrorist attacks, and then this includes domestic ter terrorist attacks such as white supremacist type organizations and, and groups like that. And then the federal government, obviously, since it's the, the primary revenue generator through federal income tax, it, uh, it is tasked with financing most of these programs as far as the poverty programs and uh, federal housing programs, even education grants uh, of those things of those nature that the federal government is getting a little bit more involved in as far as particularly providing funding for. And we've already talked about national standards as, as far as education goes and then alleviating poverty is a is a national issue. Who are the main actors? in the criminal justice system. Well, at the top of the state level, we've got the state attorney general. He's the top prosecutor of the state. They are typically elected in most states. Could be a few states that appoint, the governor appoints those. The district attorneys are the prosecuting attorneys for each of the uh, state districts that could be broken down by counties or cities. Each state is a little bit different. We, we looked at some of those comparison of the court systems and the district attorneys are the ones that are bringing the charges against people who commit crimes and the district attorney is representing the state in trying to uh, convict someone of that crime and they do have quite a bit of discretion in who to prosecute depending on how much evidence they have because of the uh, the double jeopardy rule in the fifth amendment of the constitution that if they try to convict somebody and they don't, that person's acquitted, well then they can't charge them again for that crime. So they have to be very sure. So they do have some discretion as to where or not they may 
whether it's informants, things like that, that they uh, would determine who to prosecute. Public defenders are those that are assigned by the state to handle particularly people who are unable to afford an attorney. Also, that one is mentioned in the Sixth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Defense attorneys are typically private attorneys that are hired by people accused of crimes. And then, of course, we've got a lot of law enforcement officers, whether it's highway patrol, sheriffs, police departments, chiefs, police officers. The courts are our main uh, institution in our criminal justice system. Uh, system, and it's a constitutional right that you be provided counsel, that you can remain silent uh, until you get a chance to go to the court and defend yourself. We also see that the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution says that you, the police officers have to have a warrant in order to try to gather evidence, and if that is not obtained properly, could be thrown out of court. And then touched on this a little bit already, is that quite a bit of plea bargaining, a, a majority, a clear majority of cases are kept out of the courtroom because of plea bargaining. And if not, the courtrooms would be even more log jammed and clogged than they already are. Touched on that. Now, as far as the, the citizens, the public themselves, well, they're the voters who elect these officials and then, of course, can make demands through public opinion, whether it's petitions, strikes, assemblies, whatever it takes in order to get the attention of the court system in order to have an effective system of justice. And of course, we, the citizens, make up the juries. This is a, a very unique innovation that's been around for many centuries where people who are accused of a crime have the opportunity for a jury of their peers to listen to the evidence and determine whether or not they are guilty or not guilty. Grand juries is a federal requirement in the Fifth Amendment as well. And the grand juries, now only 20 states have grand juries, so that's not a requirement for all states to do. And a grand jury looks at the evidence. They convene on a, a sporadic basis for fair, perhaps several months at a time. And the district attorney comes in and gives shows them the evidence. And the grand jury then decides whether or not there is enough evidence to make the indictment, and so they go out and charge that person, and then he goes to trial. On the local level, you may be familiar with Crime Watch in certain neighborhoods where homeowners associations in particular will collect dues from everybody in that neighborhood, put up signs, and have some sort of community network to keep out, to keep look out for other people's property, and um, might even be serve as a, a deterrence to some property crimes in that neighborhood result in catching some perpetrators. So that's how just another one of many examples of how the public gets, gets involved in the criminal justice. Now, as far as the victims of crime, you know, we, we may have a tendency to, to say, well, yeah, sometimes the victims of the crime is, is ignored. And clearly when you see that we spent quite a bit of time locking in these rights of, of the accused and being able to remain silent and due process, well, that's got to get set in stone first. Particularly, for example, if you were accused of a crime that you didn't commit, well, you would most definitely want to have all those rights in order for you to defend yourself and not just be thrown away into a dungeon and never heard from again because they didn't like you. Uh, so clearly that has to be set in stone first. But as we get into a more complicated, developed society. We, we're looking at other ways to try to help the victims of crime through compensation programs. Even the, in some cases, the criminals are required to uh, give back some, or at least pay back something that, uh, that as far as what the harm was done to the victim, some sort of compensation. Impact statements is where the family of the victim or the victims themselves can state their feelings in court. These sometimes can be very emotional and very uh, can go viral. We've had some examples we've already talked about before. 
And if there's somebody who's been victimized by someone, they have the ability to check on that prisoner's status and even have the opportunity to go to their parole hearings to, if they feel like they still may be a threat, they can go make a statement at the parole hearing. And then we also know that uh, there's laws where sex offenders have to notify where they are living. And uh, so that provides a little bit more uh, awareness for the local residents. Now, touching on, on a little bit on victimless crimes, and, the, and of course, the, the big question in here is, are they really victimless? When you've got um, victimless crimes such as prostitution, pornography, illegal drug use, people will, ask, will say, well, if, if that person wants to take drugs, he's not harming anybody except himself. Well, yes, but he, he is essentially a victim as well. But uh, there, could other be, there could be social costs to that that could victimize other people pirating of material, particularly since the internet age where free downloads and people say, oh, no big deal. Well, if, if an artist is trying to make money and they're having a hard time surviving, making money off their art or their music and people are downloading it for free, well, that would be, they would be victimized in a way that they would not be making their more money that they could be making. Seatbelt helmet laws, again, those people might say, well, if, if I want to drive without a seatbelt, why shouldn't I be able to? But uh, we're looking at social costs here. Gambling has huge social costs, but we do know that things such as prostitution, pornography, and gambling, they may start to becoming even a little bit more lenient because of their prevalence and perhaps even try to generate even more and more revenue off of them but then you've still got social costs involved as to who, who might be victimized to, to some degree. And these victimless crimes make up to about half of all arrests. And uh, so then a lot of people will say, well, wouldn't that save us a lot of time and money if we just legalized some of these, these crimes that are quote unquote victimless? Well, that's a, that's a debate that we will be having for a long time. And, um, uh, the uh, drug offenses has been one of the biggest movers in this area because we've started to decriminalize certain drugs. We've also started to treat people with drug addictions differently than the criminal population. So we're already starting to see some shift on that. And um, because one of the reasons why we have such a large incarceration rate is because we have lots of people in, in prisons for drug crimes. And so that could also potentially alleviate the prison population and then use some of this revenue as far as what we might be obtaining as far as fees and tax revenue from these former crimes that are now decriminalized and regulated and taxed for revenue, then those, those revenues could be put back in to help for the treatment and to alleviate these social costs that, that are still going to occur when people take drugs, even though it may be decriminalized. And then the designer drugs to where a new drug could come out potentially on a, on a regular basis that would be hard to detect and then could potentially have some, some safety issues or deaths involved before we could figure out what was going on on that one. The book has a section on capital punishment because that's the the most extreme form of punishment that uh, we can give. And then America still has a slight majority that uh, favors capital punishment, but that has been declining quite steadily for the last few decades. A major ruling back in 72 uh, put a moratorium, a halt on all death penalty cases and that lasted for about four or five years while they tried to get states to have more consistent death penalty practices, more consistent on who gets the death penalty because it varied from state to state and all the states had different forms of capital punishment. Some of them were pretty old, archaic, firing squads. Texas had the electric chair. The Supreme Court rules in 2005 that no juveniles will be put to death, capital punishment, so you could say that that might be 
some sort of progression as far as putting a little bit more restrictions on the death penalty. In 2008, a ruling found lethal injection valid, and that has been kind of the, the, the norm for putting people to death that is perhaps not as uh, painful or intrusive as electric chair firing squads, of those things of those natures. 32 states actually permit death penalty. We'll, we'll look at the map here in a minute. And as I said, 56% of the public favors it, but that's down pretty much. Yeah, and just a few years ago, it was about 64%. And what we see is that uh, almost 1,300 people have been executed since 1977 when they reinstated it after Foreman Furman versus Georgia, but overwhelmingly in the South. So there's some cultural elements going here. So as you can see, when you look at the number of capital punishments permitted, there's a few states that are, are, that are providing the major bulk of death penalty in, in the uh, United States, and they are all pretty much here in the Southeast. There's been several states that have just downright uh, abolished the use of capital punishment in that state, and in a lot of states where it's, it's not even really used anymore. So that's just one of these social progressions that it does appear that the support for death penalty will start to wane even further, might even be below 50%, and then there may be a few more of those states. It's uh, certainly not something that's gonna happen overnight because these, these particular states are committed to being tough on crime, and so death penalty is a little bit more accepted in those regions. Got several issues with the death penalty. The average on of time spent on death row is been estimated as high as 15 years. Just not too long ago, I saw an article about a guy who'd been uh, executed on and he'd been on death row for about 28 years. That was that was a lot. And when we see that the average life sentence is 29 years, and that these death penalty cases are very expensive, well, then it, it might even start being more and more of a rational argument just to put somebody in prison for life because it's going to be not that much more expensive than the typical death sentence. Maryland spent $186 million just on five executions, and this is because of the automatic appeals process and the amount of potential work that goes in to uh, particularly uh, opposition groups who oppose the death penalty that are that are making this uh, uh, difficult in order to carry through with it, as well as federal guarantees to uh, you know make sure that the appeal process has been been used. And of course, one of the other big issues is how disproportionate it is. Black population, which makes up 13% of our society, well, 35% of those executed are black and 42% of people on death row are black population. And despite what Furman versus Georgia was trying to do, there is still some argument as to the differences between states where it's applied somewhat capriciously or inconsistently, uh, perhaps a little bit more uh, with amb ambiguity as far as from state to state with who is going to uh, clearly when you see that some states are very proactive in, in uh, sentencing people to death whereas other states don't even use it at all so that uh, almost says right there well it kind of depends on what state you live in but what's fascinating about that as well is that when the studies look at the states that have the death penalty there does not seem to be any correlation as far as their homicide rates. It's not that people in these states are going, oh, well, gosh, they have a death penalty here, so I guess I better not commit this crime. Well, no, it doesn't work that way. The fear of getting caught is a much bigger deterrent than the fear that you could get put to death for this crime that you were meticulously planning to murder somebody. So uh, that's where uh, some of the arguments there with the capital punishment now, the, the issue of being cruel and unusual, has, as far as putting somebody to death, that um, has not necessarily come up 
that but lethal injection, which has been the the go-to method. Now it's not always swift. There have been some uh, snafus with that, with uh, the drug not working effectively, and the and the per person that was being executed stayed alive for as much as 45 minutes. Don't really know exactly what was going on there, but also brings up questions on how effective lethal injection is uh, as far as this cruel and unusual uh, question. And we also see that two-thirds of death sentences are actually overturned, and that's part of this appeal process. We also see that because the a big chunk of people that are on death row are minorities and low-income people that could not afford a dream team of a defense, and so therefore, uh, you know, this doesn't mean that they were all innocent but the, the sentences were overturned because of some something that went wrong in the, uh, in the conviction process. But we also see that because of this, the scrutiny and the appeal process, that uh, we've had 140 plus at this count that have been exonerated from death row, many of those from DNA analysis, where the, the DNA determined that it was somebody else that did the crime. So that's the question there is, is the, uh, is executing one wrong person? Is that too much? And if, if so, then the uh, death penalty may eventually go away like it has gone in many Western democracies. Most of Europe does not even use the capital punishment anymore. Now, as far as our goals in the criminal justice system, for correctional policy, the main goal, of course, is retribution or punishment. If people, particularly in a very individualist society like the United States, if people aren't following the rules and doing what they're supposed to do, they need to be punished. Again, part of the, uh, the, the Christian ethic from way back that uh, Old Testament, even the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth type of philosophy, that uh, we are a relatively punitive society compared to other countries. Now, the concept of rehabilitation has been tried various times in our history, and it has been difficult to show results. When people are put into prison, they are more likely to even come out potentially better criminals when they get out of prison because of the criminal element that they're associating with in there and the lack of opportunities that they have when they get out. So rehabilitation has been a big challenge. And so what we're doing, perhaps, in addition to punishment, is just keeping people off the streets. And uh, because if they've committed a crime, we'll see here in a minute that there's a likelihood that they might commit another crime. And so therefore, keeping them off the streets for that particular amount of time provides a social benefit. We've already talked about how putting somebody in jail is it's dubious to call that a deterrence because when we look at the particularly at the return rate of people going back to jail people as i said are not necessarily deterred by the fact that they're going to go to jail but the fact that they could get caught and it's unlikely to be swift even though the constitution guarantees us a speedy public trial because of the crowded court systems that we have, it is very unlikely to be swift. And so that uh, you know, cases linger on, makes it even more difficult to enact justice with, with clarity. So we've got some, some issues that we're dealing with. One, of course, is this concept of recidivism. According to studies, we see that about 40% of the inmates that are released are arrested within three years and returned to prison. And I've actually seen numbers as high as about 70% of people that have been released, released from prison will eventually go back to prison, eventually. So that's a pretty big, that's pretty big return rate. And here you see just within three years, that's a pretty hefty return rate. So there's, there's things going on if somebody is a is prone to criminal behavior they may always be again we can't we can't say that with certainty but the, the statistics show that yeah you know, we we kind of have to be prone 
to that type of behavior in the first place in a very stable society where we have a very strong respect for rule of law, but yet people are still breaking the law. And uh, as I said before, prisons are more of a breeding ground for more criminals. The overcrowding situation is another thing we've got to deal with. The current Trump administration has even looked at trying to reduce prison overcrowding, again, by separating the drug offense population from the criminal population. That will probably take a little bit of that load off as well. And as what we've seen here with our other comparison, the high prison rates don't necessarily relate to lower crime rates. So as you see, um, it's actually, in this particular case, it's actually an inverse relationship. As prison rates go up, we see that property crime and violent crime rates actually tend to go up. So again, that that's telling you that just because you have lots of prisons that may not necessarily be, or lots of people in prison in your state, doesn't necessarily seem to be a deterrence for people not to commit crimes. Now, there's a lot of inconsistencies in our sentencing of criminals as well. Southern states as have already shown there with the death penalty. They're generally tougher on crime as well. We see that one of 11 black men, basically 9% of all black men in the United States are in the system in some way. We already talked about how the United States has the highest incarceration rate in the world. 5% of the world population, but we have 25% of the world's prisoners. So that shows you how much of a punitive society we are. And uh, a potential debate as to whether or not that's enough or too much in our society. Now looking at the number of prisoners incarcerated by state, and this is... Uh, per 100,000, so we've already seen a correlation there as far as uh, crime rates, but these uh, states right here, as we said before, congregated in the South, these states right here have the highest prisoners incarcerated as a uh, as per 100,000 residents show, shown right there. Lowest quintile up here in the Northeast. Now, this determinate sentencing, which means that uh, sentences are, are already set, in some cases mandatory, and they vary from state to state, so that's part of the inconsistencies there. And some mandatory terms require that violent offenders to serve 85% of their sentence. So uh, that could vary dramatically when you see that some, some people may get out on parole after serving a very small percent of their sentence sentence, but we the public, in being socialized into this system, we prefer a stronger approach, a more punitive approach than a less punitive approach. That's just kind of the system that we've been socialized into. And the three strikes laws mean that if you've committed a third felony, you will automatically potentially get a life sentence. And so that that third felony could be a relatively minor one. You know, there's lots of range of felonies out there as far as potentially stealing something with a weapon, and you could get life sentence for that. So those are some some uh, things that vary from state to state that that uh, add to the inconsistencies. We're also saying that drug enforcement penalties have contributed to the big prison population, particularly as we get into the 70s and 80s. We try to enact a war on drugs to try to prevent drugs from getting more prevalent in our society. And that was uh, relatively a relative failure uh, when we look at how many people that, uh, that are taking drugs. And so it has been shifting more to a treatment program rather than an incarceration program. Even in Texas, where Texas is unlikely to legalize marijuana anytime soon, but in Texas, they actually have drug courts where the prisoners or the the uh, suspects go to a different court, and they're get they're treated differently. They're allowed to go to treatment programs or given a grace period to try to complete a treatment program while they might be on on 
probation or home arrest or wearing an ankle bracelet, things like that, and then give them a chance to kind of get out of this addiction, uh, seek help, and then avoid going to jail. We also see as more and more prisoners get older and older in, in these uh, prisons, they become geriatric hospitals. So obviously, the older you get, the more health care you need. And particularly, if you live that kind of lifestyle, you may be even more in need, you know, health care. So the elder inmate is as much as three times more expensive than your average inmate in the prison system. We see that there's uh, 2.3 million people in prisons in the U.S. And because of this overcrowding, we see that many is four per cell. We have also had in in uh, minimum, more minimum security type of situation. We have barracks where the prisoners are staying, and there have been some federal directions in order to try to reduce populations. As I said, the current administration is, has been looking at trying to do that. Costs are astronomical, forty-seven billion per year, and uh, what is most prevalent here is that it's a, been a huge increase in costs since 1985. So we're looking at about $30,000 per year per inmate in order to uh, incarcerate people in America. So we've got various other strategies that are trying to reduce the load in our prison system. Backdoor strategies is where you might have more opportunities for earlier release, provide some sort of risk analysis, which requires some scientific uh, uh, testing here that uh, whether or not this person is a higher risk or a lower risk, might be eligible to get out early. We've already you know, talked a little bit about parole, which is typically mandated at a certain time that you'd be eligible for parole. And probation, of course, has meant that you would, would be under supervision instead of going to, to prison or jail. And um, so those are being looked at potentially more, but of course that could put even more case load on parole and probation officers, which are already kind of at a shortage there. And it's going to require some element of training in order to get those placed in a decent job, some form of counseling to try to reduce, hopefully, the recidivist rate. And a lot of it is social stigma because people coming out of prison are facing discrimination. And so that's part of the equation that is very difficult for government to require people to not be suspicious or, or discriminatory towards hiring somebody that they may feel uncomfortable with. Uh, you know, so these are kind of human, human emotions here. And uh, I've already talked about the overwork ratio of loading more and more probationary situations onto uh, on these officers. I've already talked about electronic house statisticians, such as ankle bracelets. This could be cheaper and be, uh, it has shown to be effective in the uh, Texas drug courts that I mentioned earlier, where that uh, clearly is going to reduce the prison population. And uh, But then, of course, it puts a little bit more load on the officers that have to uh, monitor these uh, people. Uh, and then vocational programs. Those have to be provided by some fund somewhere in order to try to provide additional training, which you've already talked about, and order in given some trying to ensure some sort of wages for the people that are coming out of jail early or not going to jail. The front door strategies would be to perhaps lower the sentences in the first place. That's always been a debate to where in America sometimes. The, uh, you know, we're, like I said, we're a very punitive society. If somebody commits a heinous crime, uh, we, in many cases, would not want that person ever to see the light of day. And so that's kind of what we have to deal with. Would we, because in some Western societies, the people don't spend near as much time in jail. And uh, could there be some form of community service or fines that would suffice instead of sending someone to prison, which could then have that that cyclical effect and uh, things called regional restitution centers where the uh, the criminals and when they get out in order to pay off the restitution would have places to go to help pay that off to work during the day and stay incarcerated at night 
So part of that pay will then go to their victims. So that you've got some fairly creative ideas going on there to, to let people out of prison in order to work, to pay off their crime. And uh, so it depends, and it's a state-to-state -state decision there since states are tasked with this for the most part. There will be some federal direction here and there. Now, surveillance, you know, even beyond the ankle bracelets, ankle bracelets is an option there to try to uh, have more intensive supervision on probation so that uh, that would deter them from committing crime while they're on probation. There's other things that, uh, again, not the old shock therapy like that was in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, but there are some forms of shock therapy therapy that can provide some sort of meditative type effects. We see that boot camp, particularly for younger offenders, could be an alternative to going to prison, perhaps even uh, provide a little bit of discipline. So we've, we've got lots of other strategies out there. I've already talked about the drug courts, which uh, since my, my brother-in-law is a judge in Texas, and he is also one of these uh, drug court judges as well, and they have shown some success. And then, of course, the other side of the equation is just build more prisons. If we're going to have this many people in our society that we want to incarcerate, well, the supply side solution then, of course, is to just have more prisons that we can put them in. And uh, that, that costs money. Now, privatization of prisons, we, uh, we see that there's only about 8% of prisoners that are in private prisons and pretty much have a an oligopoly here. Two firms account for the vast majority of private prisoners, and there's still lots of questions, lots of debate on whether or not this is an effective alternative because the savings have been somewhat marginal because the firms still have to operate these um, prisons on a contract that is paid by the, by the government, and they these firms have to make a little bit of a profit in order to keep operating. So you're not seeing a whole lot of savings there once the contract has been given. They may have a little bit of flexibility there where the, the, the local government could save a little bit on administrative costs and still require the prison to conform to state standards or federal standards. But we also see that there's an issue as to whether or not privatized guards are able to you know, enact a public service as far as what prisons are concerned. And then the, uh, the Supreme Court recently ruled that private guards are not entitled to immunity as, they, as a public paid guard might be uh, able to get as providing a public service. So if a private guard's there trying to make a profit, so to speak, working for a private firm, they, there's a few legal issues there that need to be resolved as far as that um, delegating this uh, this traditionally public service to a private entity and then holding them accountable is also part of that factor as well. Are there inspections? Are there regulations that they have to comply to? What might they not be doing that the uh, federal or state prisons would, would require them to do? Prisons are the fastest growing budget item in a lot of states. Now, you look at a comparison here. We've already talked about this. Between $4,000 and $8,000 per year for a child's education, prisoners cost up to about $30,000 per year. Now, there have been some studies that show that if you, they did this uh, kind of a cost-benefit analysis is here, that imprisoning 100 typical felons cost about $2.5 million. However, Leaving them on the street, their social costs add up to about $4.6 million as far as property theft, damage, whatever cost to the justice system. So as you can see, looking at that cost-benefit analysis, it's actually more rational to keep them off the street for that period of time. And so that's you know, part, of the, part of the debate. Now, as far as continuing this challenge, the... Famous quote, the society can be judged by entering its prison. So obviously we want to be a humane, fair society that even though people have gone through the due process and they were convicted and uh, have to be held 
in incarcerated, well, we want those to be very fair and humane type situations as well. And but coming back to the the uh, the central root is that in America, in general, American citizens don't want to coddle criminals. They want them to be punished. Punished. It's not supposed to be a country club. And uh, so that's a trade-off there as far as human rights versus punishment. And the, the opposite line there would be prisons should offer a tour through the circles of hell. That's probably pretty extreme, but there certainly would be uh, citizens in the United States that would lean more towards that system of justice as far as punitive punishment. And so the question remains, can we actually rehabilitate people that go to prisons or is it just just punishment, getting them off the street? Here are some resources there that, um, that could be used for more insight on the criminal justice system.